Well, it's great to be back here again. The, I have to say, the life expectancy of futurists is very short, okay? <laughs> because the, it's easy to make the prediction, it's less easy to live by it. And uh, when I wrote my latest book, The Future of Almost Everything, I thought that I, having been uh, in this business for 30 years, I ought to judge my own standards by looking back. And uh, uh, I phoned the publisher, I said, I've got a problem. He said, what's that? He said, I've just read FutureWise, which I wrote in 1998. He said, yes. He said, I think it's rather good. Uh, do you mind if I borrow it and I cut and paste whole sections from the 1998 book and put it straight into the latest edition? He said, well, uh, uh, yeah, fine. Because I said, we are only 20 years through a 50-year view, and of course, it's just beginning. <laughs> so, so actually, one of the lessons of the future is that sometimes, as we will see, things change less rapidly than we think. Let's go on a journey into the future of the next 10. But firstly, let's go back another five. So um, if uh, I'm not seeing anything here <laughs> on this monitor on the left-hand side. I'm only seeing it on the right. Can I see my image on the both screens, please? Thanks. Um, so, uh, you know, the messages I had five years ago were these. Firstly, that we would see dramatic changes in customer expectations. Of course, we're right in the middle of that. That's nothing new now. Um, secondly, that mobile banking is going to completely, completely wrong foot all kinds of banking structures all over the world. That's certainly going on. Thirdly, market research will give some spectacularly wrong answers. That's certainly true. <laughs> so people like my mum, you know, she gets asked every year, um, are you interested in online banking? She, yeah, I must be joking. Are you interested in telephone banking? No. <laughs> um, because uh, she's a typical private banking client, 85 years old, everything done face to face, right? And then, uh, and then one day she changes. One day she suddenly goes on to FaceTime, starts uh, uh, um, getting a huge machine, she's gone mobile, and she phones the bank up, and uh, she then complains to me. She says, Patrick, she says, uh, the machine you got me is terrible. She says, it's, it's awful. I don't know what's wrong with my bank. Uh, FaceTime call with me now. I keep phoning them, but they can't see me. So what happened? What happened? I mean, how long? Put your hands up if you FaceTime your kids. Put up your hands if you FaceTime your bank. What happened? What happened was the world jumped into the future. My mother took a 40-year jump into the future. She uh, completely forgot all the market research answers she had been giving the researchers for the last 20 years. And in 20 minutes, she moved 20 years into the future and left the bank behind. How long will it take her bank to produce the ability to talk with her on a video call? What do you think? <laughs> I think it'll take two years to sign off the system, another three to test it, by which time my mother will have passed on. <laughs> so it's <laughs> perhaps, I mean, it's honestly, I just say market research has proven spectacularly incorrect. Major events will overtake many bank strategies. That I'll show some examples of that. Um, I predicted that many banks would fail the 216 tests. That certainly happened. I predict that the lawsuits on LIBOR will turn out to be larger than the LIBOR fines. Uh, we're in the middle of that right now. Um, I said that many banks would be so paralyzed by legacy IT that they'd give up altogether and start again. We'll see some more examples of that. Um, I've s I said that we would see more questions regarding the future ethics of actively managed funds. This is turning out to be one of the biggest next banking scandals or financial service scandals for reasons that we could look at. Um, I said that we would see huge growth in cyber attacks. I'm going to show you where we are on that, sadly. And finally, that the future, we won't get there without cooperation. That is to say, by re-meeting again on a regular basis, I gather there's a whole load of banks, for instance, from Austria. Put your hands up if you're here from Austria. Uh, you know, you're here as a group, you're communicating together in a way you're competitors, but we have to have the conversation together. So, what is the future? <laughs> okay. The first thing I'd say is this, that institutional blindness is the greatest risk for the, any CEO of a bank today. The reason why the subprime crisis happened was because of a collective madness. I remember before it took place, I was worried. I, 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 quite a lot of dinners. I'd go to the dinner the night before talking to a, a big bank. And I'd go around the room and say, what do you do? I'm in retail banking. And so I asked people in a circle what they did. What do you do? I'm in retail banking. What do you do? I'm in wholesale banking. What do you do? I'm in, I'm in uh, uh, Forex. I'm, and what do you do? And two minutes later, this strange chap would be explaining what he does. And then, what do you do? Well, you know, I, I do HR. What do you do? I do legal. 
And this was regularly happening on every single table that I ever sat on with Banks. There'd always be someone who would suddenly answer the question with a two-minute thing. Eventually, well, I, I just thought it was because I was stupid, that uh, maybe because I'm not a banker, you know, he felt he had to explain. And so I suddenly turned to my other guests. I started turning. Whenever this happened, this was in, uh, two years before the crisis, two years before the crisis, I started turning on every table. I would say, by the way, you're from retail. Do you understand a single word of what he's just been saying? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> and they go all the way around. And then I'd say to the individual, um, Paul, do you understand a single word of what you said? And he said, well, <laughs> he says, on a good day, I am... <laughs> <laughs> on a good day, he says, I get out of bed, I have a shower, and I get it together. And for about 15 minutes, I can, I, I got my mind around it. <laughs> but by the time I get to work, it's sort of slipping away from me. <laughs> Why? Because the pro I said, dude, the regulators, I said, the regulators haven't a clue what I'm doing. He said, well, what about your board and the risk teams? No, 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 they don't really understand. I hardly understand what I'm doing. No wonder we had a subprime crisis. I'm just saying, it's easy... It's easy for all of us to find ourselves collectively having a blind spot. So, in order to see the future, we have to somehow take off our normal day-to-day -day glasses to think again. Let me give you some examples of blindness. And, you know, when it comes to the future of retail banking, which is mainly my issue today, um, I'd say this, that small things will create huge magic, will make gigantic differences, whether it's in managing risk or enhancing customer experience. Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples before we get into your industry. So, okay, so I, I, let's say I, I, go to, I go to Lisbon here. Fantastic city, wonderful Michelin star uh, food. Put up your hands if you've gone to a fantastic Michelin star restaurant, but you couldn't catch the waiter's attention. You couldn't catch the waiter's attention. You could put your hands up if you've had that experience. Come on, folks, it's a very, very common. So what is it about this? You know, it, it costs nothing. It costs nothing to teach the waiter to use his eyes. I used to work when I was a student in a restaurant, and I learned that I could read tables walking backwards at two or three kilometers <laughs> per second, <laughs> carrying 12, 14 different plates. And every time I blink, I make money. Every time I smile, champagne, coffee, sweet. It saves so much time. By the time I come back to the kitchen, champagne, coffee, sweet. Yes, Bill, mm -hmm. coffee. Another bottle of wine. And do you know what? Almost the entire profit of the restaurant comes from the second bottle of wine, the coffee, the sweet. So oh, how long long for the restaurant to turn to profit? One day. How long to teach the trick? 20 seconds. How could it be that Michelin star restaurants around the world make such a terrible mistake? Here is another example. My wife and I went to a restaurant in Singapore. It was so dark that uh, not only did they have to bring a little box with reading glasses for everybody, but they also had to bring torches. Has anybody been to that restaurant? <laughs> You've been there. It's incredible. What is they doing? Why couldn't they print the menu large enough for me to read it without my glasses? And crazy, here's another example. Last week, I was so jet-lagged, I could hardly stand. You know, every time you lose one hour, just one hour of sleep, you lose 10 points on your IQ, okay? It's really important. So don't make any decisions about risk when you're jet lagged. <laughs> the biggest investment you can make in reducing risk is a business class seat to sleep in. Okay. But, but here, here I was, I was very jet lagged in the morning. I staggered into the shower trying to find my way in and then I had a disaster. I confess to you that by accident, I had a shower in hair conditioner. Now I know that none, none of you would ever fall for such a crazy thing. Okay, <laughs> all right. Put up your hands if you too have had a hair conditioner experience by accident in a shower because you couldn't read what was on the bottle. Put up your hands, now, Sherry. Look around. 25% of all the people here have had hair conditioner experiences recently. Someone came up to me last week when I told this story. He said, it was worse for me. He said, I got the hair conditioner off, which took 10 minutes. I then had another disaster with hair, with, um, with, uh, with hair wax. <laughs> so... But it's, you might think this is to do with my failures in market research. It's not. It's real blindness. Let me tell you why. I can prove it. I was with, I've, been telling, I've been doing this survey for years, and I can tell you that a quarter of all executives have problems in the shower. Okay? Why? Because, you see, we need glasses in the shower, and nobody wears their glasses in the shower. Correct? 
That's your problem, isn't it? You think you're staggering around, you're half jet lag, go into the shower. Someone told me last night, he said, you know what? He said, I've got a trick. He said, I, I was speaking in London yesterday. He came up to me, he said, I've got a trick. He said, what I'd always do is I take a black felt tip pen with me to hotels. And the moment I check in, I go into the shower, I pick up with my glasses what I'm going to use tomorrow morning, and I mark it S. That's what I do. I'm, I'm just saying, you would think this is just because of market research and uh, you know, a failure to understand the customer. No, it's complete blindness. I prove it to you. So I was with 800 CEOs of, of, of hotel chains. The head of W, the head of, uh, the, head of the Hilton in, in, in Madrid and so on. They were all in my audience in Qatar. So I thought I should give them some feedback about institutional blindness. So I asked them a question. Well, I said, look, I, I need you to know there's a problem. Uh, and small things create magic. Just print a bigger label on the bottle. Uh, by the way, put up your hands if you have had a shower in hair conditioner in your own hotel in the last four months. 40% of them put their hands up. So I'm telling you the truth. What's happening is that we're seeing that how easy it is to miss things. If they can miss things that are happening in their own lives without making the connection that it's really important to their business, then for sure, when it comes to managing risk, it's easy for us to, re to miss things. Really easy. So let's now, therefore go on a journey. One tiny final story. I, I, was, in the retail, uh, I was in retail mall in Athens recently. There's 500 million euros spent, but there were no chairs. Put up your hands if you've been looking for a chair when you were shopping once. Crazy. Crazy. How much does a chair cost? 60 euros. If they give you a chair, you'll stay there doing your email for two hours, right? And then you spend. So tiny things create huge magic. OK. And certainly, tiny things can create agility. You might not think it, but they do. And agility is fundamentally important at the moment for the next five to 10 years in banking. It doesn't matter what industry you're in, stuff happens. And yes, it could be something like, like LIBOR, it could be um, a tweet from President Trump that changes a, a, a position uh, that disturbs a market, it could be an event such as Brexit. By the way, Brexit has been somewhat overplayed. Let me just remind you of the, of the ultimate truth about this particular thing. Uh, the UK has been part of Europe for 100 million years and will continue to be so. That's the first fact. The second fact, as you will know because you're in banking, that people have always traded across borders. It doesn't matter whether the Romans created the borders, or the Greeks, <laughs> or whichever generation it is, or whatever political movement tries to put up a strong border. And the stronger the border is, the more they smuggle. That's what's been happening for 3,000 years. Trade has never stopped in human history. We've always traded from one village to the next, and we couldn't care less where the political boundary is. That is the fact. So, fact. Will um, European countries like France trade vigorously with the UK in 40 years' time? Of course. Absolutely. In financial services? Absolutely. In, tra in, in goods and, and everything else? Absolutely. So what is this all about? It's about pieces of paper. Yes, they're really important. But in terms of long-term impact, actually, the story is elsewhere. Because the story of economic growth for uh, Europe can't come from Europe. It's going to, where, you know, we have, we have uh, we'll see in a moment, you know, we have 85% of humanity lives in emerging markets. This is the growth area for Europe. The growth areas of Europe are the growth areas for the UK. The future of the UK isn't in Europe in terms of economic growth. The future of the UK, the future of France, the future of Germany is in emerging markets. Either emerging market money coming in, or us investing into emerging markets, driving this enormous change. So, what about banking strategies? Well, here's a prediction. Banking strategies will, become, will be overtaken regularly by events. I'll just give you one example. I was with um, a senior bank, uh, uh, which, uh, a Nordic bank, I will not name it, a Nordic bank. I was in the middle of a program with a member of their board sharing a platform. The member of the board had rushed straight from a board meeting which had been running continuously for a whole week. It was not scheduled. It was an emergency meeting and it was running 12 hours a day, seven days a week and showed no time of finishing. He managed to escape for an hour to be on this platform and then straight back into the board again. 
Why? Because an event had come which had upturned their strategy. What was it? It was being mentioned in a Panama paper leak, and they had no idea what the substance of it was, how many clients it involved, and it was very difficult to navigate response. Big risk, reputation risk, is the number one risk for banking. Five-second banking, what is this all about? Well, the Panama paper showed that a five-second leak into the media can disrupt a board's ability to make decisions for months. Huge. What is this five-second test about? All of you have been tracked since you came in by Google. Google is a client of mine. Um, and uh, Google knows how you use your, 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 uh, your, your smartphone. It knows uh, what, what type of things you look for, but most importantly, what you do. So most important thing for Google is to know how long you stay on the things it gives you. So if you type in Caribbean holiday and you, type and you click on a website for Antigua and you stay on that website for half an hour, Google regards that as evidence that it has been useful to you. If you're just there for 20 seconds, it's useless. So the, what Google's been watching is how many seconds you will take on a slow web page before you give up. So Google makes a nice suggestion to you. You press on it because it's the most attractive link. The question is, how many seconds do you wait before you press the back button? Well, Google knows that 70% of you terminate a business relationship in 360 seconds. <laughs> Actually, less. Three seconds. Three seconds and you're out. How, old, how long do you think your children are taking? What do you think Google reckons? Uh, a 20-year-old is typically Google seeing them about 1.5 to 1.8 seconds. I have seven grandchildren, all of them very, very young. <laughs> so life suddenly got incredibly busy. Do you know the attention span of a, of a one-year-old <laughs> online, I can tell you, is a fraction of a millisecond, and it's not going to get any older, um, any longer as they get older. How long do you think your attention span will be? How long will you wait for a slow web page in two years' time? What do you think? And you're already out. You've terminated a business relationship. You'll never return to that website in three seconds. One second, you are irritated. Two seconds, you think the web is broken. After three seconds, you think the North Korean government is attacking the entire infrastructure of Portugal. And after four seconds, you have lost the world to live. That's it, finished. So this is happening very, very fast. It influences everything to do with retail banking. And if you remember nothing else, think of this. Because it's the greatest challenge for us in terms of managing the risk. Because the customer is expecting a decision on a mortgage in three seconds. I can't tell you how furious I get when I type in an online form to try and get a quote. I'm trying to get travel insurance. My wife and I are going to sail across the Atlantic uh, this, this December. And uh, we suddenly realize we need some extra health cover <laughs> when we are 1,000 uh, miles offshore. Um, and uh, every time I fill in a form, I get to the end of this horrible form, which takes absolutely ages, and then presses the button and says, a representative will call you shortly. I don't want to be called. Why? Because three seconds is like a million years. After four seconds, I'm terminating the business relationship. I'm out, finished, gone. Psychologically, I'm busted after four seconds. Put up your hands if you find it frustrating when you type in long forms online. See, this is, this is what the future of banking is all about. We are going to have to speed this stuff up, really speed it up. The payment systems are too slow, and it really, really sucks. So for example, 42% of millennials would do far more online if payments were faster. They say it's just too slow. You say, well, it seems quite fast to me. Actually, Amazon's quite good. It is pretty fast for Amazon. Still too slow. It doesn't meet the three-second test. Um, as for this, so my wife's trying to get money back, has, was, was trying to get money back from the electricity company. She typed one for accounts, two customer service to get back 1,000 euros. Okay. Your call is, the compliance message is 120 seconds long before she gets to the numbers, and then she is given 15 numbers to press. Put your hands up if you find it very annoying. You have stolen 1,000 euros, now they are stealing your time. Put up your hands if you think this is wrong. Okay. Put up your hands if your bank has such a system. Come on, come on. <laughs> come on. Come on, okay. L listen, listen, listen. This is off the record. We'll, we'll take this out of the recording, okay, sir. <laughs> but I, I'm just saying it's easy to be blind. It's easy to be blind. 
You've told me that you want to kill people who waste three seconds of your time. You've told me that you have particularly think it's evil for anybody to make you push buttons on a, on a call center. I'm just saying we need to think through ways of doing these things better. And we have it. The technology is here. Um, there's no way. I, I don't lose landlines anymore. And actually, the generation of my children don't use voice calls. Do you know the only reason my, generation, my children's generation use voice calls is to do one thing only. Do you know what it is? Phone home. Phone dad. <laughs> phone mum. Apart from that, it's not really a voice environment at all. So I tell you, for my son to pick up the phone and phone a bank, this is serious. This probably means his identity has been stolen or something. And he will be really cross to get through to a robot. Actually, we know who my son is. We know who you are. Why? Because we know your mobile phone number. And AI, even very simple AI, will tell us why you're calling. <laughs> if you only received your bank statement through the email 20 seconds ago, we know it's about something in your bank statement. If, uh, if you just had a, a, um, a big transaction, one of the largest payments you've ever paid for on your American Express card just 15 seconds ago, it, we know it's about that. It's not beyond the intelligence of human beings, let alone robots, to be able to fix these things. Okay. However, while many things are changing a lot, the reason why I'm still in business is because so little is changing in other parts of banking, <laughs> even in retail in some parts. So, you might think this is a very strange, strange, strange futurist. But let me show you. What about cash? So, uh, our cash, well, uh, yes, it's true. Mobile phone, uh, we could spend all day talking about mobile payments, and we will. But the fact is that if you look at the truth, the truth is that the amount of cash in your pockets in this room is higher than it has been for a very long time. <laughs> Why is this? Why? Because the world is driven by a word which is even more important in banking than technology, even more important than risk or innovation or products or customer experience. And this word is emotion. This is the same emotion that we get when we are cross at covering ourselves with, with hair conditioner, when we are annoyed after three seconds because the web page won't load, when we want to kill someone who has put in a, a robot answering system, or uh, Actually, cash. Cash has this powerful emotional attraction for many, many people. I was talking to, to a colleague earlier, just a few minutes ago, who was saying, actually, I come from, uh, from Belgium. I'm having real problems at the moment. I said, why is that? I don't like using cash, but I'm being forced to because so few traders are in this world. I'm just saying it's easy to be seduced by the story of constant overwhelming, radical change, what we must do is apply a reality test or you will find yourself managing the wrong risks and losing huge amounts of money. What we need to be doing is paying close attention to the real risks and be, and be very careful uh, about the unreality. Here's another example of unreality. Put up your hands if you own a 3D TV. Fantastic. Actually, this is extraordinary. I have never been in a conference where such a high proportion of the audience owns 3D TVs. We need to actually, I think, invite all of you to, to make an agreement to donate your TVs to a museum. Why? Because we can't buy them anymore. You, are, you were early leaders, but you can't buy them. Why? Because they were full of, wow. But they didn't create enough magic for most people here to buy them. You can have great technology, great innovation as a bank, and waste it all if it doesn't actually connect with emotion. Uh, here's another example. Uh, 3D printers. We were told that uh, 3D printing, printing at home, is the future of manufacturing, retail, wholesale. It's going to disintermediate, all kinds of things. Put up your hands if you own a 3D printer. I do. I, I can tell you it's very boring to print toys. <laughs> I quite like going shopping. <laughs> it's very slow. 3D printing is fantastic for innovation in aerospace, satellites, planes, cars. But please don't. Oh, and to print organs for people, human beings, but using your own cells. But please don't tell me that the whole world is going to be printing things at home. It's stupid. I'm just saying, let's have a reality check. Here's another one. Last week, I was with Canon in Germany, who make the most enormous printing devices. Are things which can bubble jet printers which print at 100 meters per second. 
perfect. Resolution quality, you cannot see the dots. Unbelievable technology. The reason they're doing that is because of what's been happening with books and things like that. So people said books are over. I didn't believe them, which is why I wrote my 17th book last year. In fact, I wrote two books over the summer for each of our grandchildren. I wrote single books, a single book for each family, only one copy in the whole world using digital printing, using that kind of technology. Amazing, fun. You see, physical books matter. People said that Kindle would be the answer. Okay, but Kindle cells are falling. And the number of people reading on a Kindle is stable, it's flat. It's not killed physical books. Why is that? Same reason as cash. That actually there are these powerful emotional forces which keep us in, uh, in a traditional way of life longer than many futurists like to pretend. So I'm telling you the truth, my friends. Actually, some things are going to change dramatically in the next five. Some things are not. I'd say the print has got a great future in the next five years. Actually, so has cash. Cash will peak and start to fall in the European Union in the next couple of years, I think. I might be wrong, it might be three or four. You see, most debates about the future are not about the direction of a trend. It's about one word, which is timing. It's about by when. You know, by when will cash use peak in the European Union? We all know it will, but will it peak in 2015? I think it will peak, well, not in 2015, 225. Will it, or will it peak in 235? That's an important question if you are a bank. So as I've said, there is one word that will dominate the future. It's emotion, and the emotions we have, the passions of our customers, will shape the future of financial services more than sometimes we realize. Linked to trust. And trust, as I said five years ago, is the greatest asset for any bank. It takes 10 seconds to start to lose it. One big data loss is enough to destroy 30 years of trust especially if you've built your entire reputation on privacy, as, say, Swiss banks have done. Really important. Actually, trust is the only thing that British Airways uh, uh, sells. I I'm flying on, on Portuguese Airways today. Trust is the only thing they sell. I want to know the plane is safe. The rest is an added factor. <laughs> I want to believe the, pla the plane will be reliable, will go on time, um, that the food will be clean and won't give me food poisoning. <laughs> trust. Fundamental. Trust. So trust uh, in the bank, trust in systems, trust in what the bank is saying. You know, I, I uh, um, started off as a physician looking after people dying of cancer at home. And I learned that life is very short. If people were coming to see me, they would be dead in less than eight weeks. I learned that every day matters. I believe this personally. Life's too short to sell products I don't believe in. Put up your hands if you think that's true. Life's too short to sell something you know is the wrong product, isn't it? Put up your hands if you think that's true. Life's too short to recommend a product if a competitor has really got a better one. Put up your hands if you think that's true. I was once asked to go to a conference in the US. It was about financial services. When I arrived, the guy said, you don't know why you're here, do you? I said, no, I have no idea. He said, you went and uh, gave a talk to some board or other. And he named the company, a huge multinational. Yes, I remember them well. He said, well, a non-executive was the head of private banking of one of the largest banks in the world. Oh, and she's the CEO, so that's why she's invited you. Oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Well, she was very upset on that day. So, oh, I'm terrible. No, 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 don't be. It changed her life. What happened? Well, she showed a slide, something about life being too short. And she suddenly realized that she couldn't do what she was doing anymore because in that particular job, she realized that a lot of products she was selling were not the right products for the client. And she felt under pressure to sell things which were not right, with commission structures which were not transparent, with all kinds of hidden charges, things that she would never have sold to her mother or her best friend. She saw that slide, she had a terrible night's sleep and she resigned the following day. She said it's the best thing she ever did. Why? Because now she's selling things that she believes in. It's really important. Actually, if you want to know one of the biggest risks inside your bank, it's people who don't follow this. <laughs> one of the biggest risks in terms of mis-selling inside your bank is people who are selling things they don't believe in. They wouldn't sell to a cat or a dog, but they're selling them. They're selling them. They're selling them. They're knowing full well because they're lacking integrity. 
And they're doing it for a fast buck. They're doing it because they're afraid of getting their job lost or whatever it is. These are really big risks. They're the human risks of people who... I was talking yesterday at a, at a medical conference about ethics to do with embryos and testing of embryos. And I said, you know what? One thing I've learned in banking is this, that the ease is very important, the ease we have. You can sit in a board meeting in, you, in your own role. You can sit in a board meeting. And sometimes I've sat in board meetings too, and something is said by someone. Someone proposes something, and in my guts, I can't explain it. The, the lawyers are saying it's absolutely fine. The regulators, you know, the people who are really experts in regulation saying, technically, it's fine. But there's something inside me which is just a little bit... So put up your hands if you've ever had that feeling. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm talking about? Put it, wave it for me. Otherwise, I think I'm very lonely. You just had that little feeling, didn't you? Just, it didn't sit quite right with you. You weren't even sure who to talk to about it. You just went home, had a bad night's sleep, came back the following day. You know what? This kind of... Um, this inner voice is one of the greatest protections of the bank. Because often it, we're dealing with things that are very complicated, it's not black and white, but often we make this lateral leap. It's almost an irrational thing. And it takes a while logically to work out the 10 reasons why it's actually not quite right. <laughs> or we could get into trouble over it in the future. It's very important. This ethic is really important in advertising. Um, because actually, People don't like being marketed to anymore. <laughs> what we're talking about is going on a journey of life as a personal guide. And banks are so well placed to do this. As a trusted partner, uh, your client knows what you do. They know that you know what they do. You know how they spend. You control their money. You've got their mortgage. You, 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 have, the, uh, you have a big chunk of their pension. You've had, the, you've had their account for 20 years. Uh, they are allowing you to see their location data. They're allowing you to join up with some clever fintech companies, uh, some, some other understanding of other things which they're doing. And suddenly, we're in a fantastic place to become their mentor, coach, and guide, informing them and revealing to them moments of truth that will help them. Very different from the traditional way of working with banking. And people talk to me about big data, I'd say this, I, I'd make a prediction. I think the largest banks will lose at least $2 billion on wasted big data experiments over the next five years. Because almost all the value of the big data is in tiny data. <laughs> it's in a tiny fragment of the subset where almost all the value is for them. And knowing what that is, and then applying the, 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 the real genius is what, is, is, is what really delivers the value. And uh, um, I, I guess to give you a tiny example of it, British Airways wrote me a letter. And I always open British Airways emails because they work with little data and they're very clever. So they wrote a, an email to me and they said, Dr. Dixon, they said, Dr. Dixon, where do you disappear to? I said, what? <laughs> what you? And he says, dear Dr. Dixon, we're trying our best to help you, but you keep flying off our radar screens and we have no idea where you go. I said, what? We keep sending you all over the world, but you disappear. We never bring you home. To encourage you to come home more often, we're going to give you some round-the-world tickets for you and your wife for free. Uh, please dial this number now to redeem. <laughs> I thought that was very clever. <laughs> it was just clever. Now, do you think Google produced that? Do you think an AI algorithm or a robot produced that campaign? No. I think someone like you had a shower one morning, woke up, had a moment of genius, walking the dog. He said, do you know what? I bet we've got a whole load of... We had this, you know, we're losing revenue because of all these single tickets. I bet, there's, I bet there's a story there. And you then started to set up an AI inquiry into short journeys and started to run the numbers and up pops some extraordinary things. That becomes the basis of a very clever marketing campaign. As a result, I'm promoting British Airways today. Clever things, clever things. Um, and little data can produce tremendous uplift when it's combined with other things. Now, um, for instance, uh, if, if uh, let's suppose I'm, I'm searching for a mortgage online, okay, and I've even got half through the wretched form filling it in, but I've abandoned it. Actually, 66% of things that you put in your basket to buy online, you never buy. <laughs> Did you know that? <laughs> they just sit there. Put up your hands if you had to go back to the same website and the 
basket's already empty and you can't remember where to find what it was. Put it behind you if you had that problem. You know, these are real things, aren't they? Well, what we've discovered is this, that if, if you can detect on the website when someone has, has you know, got as far as putting something in the basket, and you know who they are, and you have permission with GDPR legislation to market to them, then, then actually, if you can get a beautiful piece of printed collateral into their hands the following morning, say, uh, uh, say dear Patrick, this is, this is, just a, this is from Barclays. Um, we are just delighted to tell you that we have a special mortgage offer that's running for the next 48 hours. And actually, if you were to go click on this particular button, uh, we can give it to you, and it's an extra 5% off your first year's payments. What happens is the response rate goes up 6%, the average order value goes up 8% of what's ever in the basket, and the abandoned baskets go down so that they're actually the minority. I can't tell you, if, if this was a marketing conference, you'd hear the intake of breath. I mean, this makes all the difference between a campaign that doesn't work and a campaign that you, know, you, you have to report to the stock exchange because it's, it's going to change your profits. Very big things from tiny data. And of course, the other big change is, is, is well, we were talking about it five years ago, but it's, it really is here now. The total mobile being driven by emerging markets, as I predicted back then. So 85% you know, of humanity, as I said, lives in emerging markets. 1% <laughs> owns 50% of the world. Um, this is a gigantic number of people, actually, and they are growing every day, and they are living in India, China, Indonesia, Singapore, Malaysia. One billion human beings will move from where they're living today to a new home a long way away in the next 30 years. Most of them, when they arrive, will live in a megacity, in a shack made of pieces of plastic and corrugated iron. But these are the middle-class banking customers of tomorrow. And almost all of them, the moment they hit the city, they need to send money back. And remittances from migrants back home sent from, uh, say, a to a rural village in Kenya, from a small town in Kenya, or from, the, the, uh, let's say, Portugal, to a rural town in Kenya. Remittances has been the number one driver of the radical digital smartphone revolution in the world today. It surpasses any other single factor. Um, and uh, we, have three billion, we will have three billion people banking on mobile devices by 2021. As I say, most of them will be simply remitting. That'll be what they'll be doing. Moving money around using not a bank, but a telco or whatever it is they're using, some kind of app or something like that. Meanwhile, we've got gigantic convulsive changes being pushed from above. You see, the UK, we're in a terrible mess because we've got this strange thing called democracy, which was invented in Westminster some years ago, and people can't agree what they want to do, so you have paralysis. India has a form of democracy as well, but it's much more presidential. So President Modi is able, as a result of taking a single pen on a single piece of paper, and, and with one signature, he abolished 80% of all banknotes in the country, just like that. What will be the next signature do you think he's going to sign? And what will be the one after that? Because this is the largest nation on earth, folks. Do you know when it comes to biometrics, we often talk about biometrics in banking here. India has already, because of one signature, the second signature on another piece of paper was that all Indian citizens, whether they can read or write or not, we will know their retinas and their fingerprints for banking. That's happened. 860 million human beings in India have their retinas, their fingerprints and other things on a database. Why? Because President Modi wants people who don't know what banking is and they can't read or write, they can't add up. He wants to be able to pay them digitally from the government their benefits and for them to be in the digital world. I'm just saying, watch out. Some things are not changing, but other things will change convulsively and at extraordinary speed. So my greatest question for you today is, that was just two pieces of paper that President Modi signed. What will be the third? What will be the fourth? How many days will it be, or weeks or months, before the next piece of paper makes it illegal to actually use a piece of paper for a transaction such as a banknote. How long would it be? Put up your hands if you think 
that President Modi could decide to completely digitize cash within the next 20 years, or someone like him could just put, sign a piece of paper and five years later, all cash has gone from India. Put up your hands if you think that could happen. Could happen, not very likely, but could happen in the next 20 years. Put your hands up. Put your hands up if you think fanciful nonsense would never happen. See, okay, so what we've got, we are, we're, we're in a challenging time then. We're, we're, I'll tell you, these are risks. They're opportunities too. Because what we've got is half the room saying, you know what? This could happen. Actually, it could happen in five. Some people are saying maybe it could happen in five. Others are saying not a chance. Okay? So big debate going on about the future. I, I, I think it's unlikely. I think it's unlikely, but I tell you this, India isn't going to stop. You see, China, China I tell you China's ambition. China's ambition as a manufacturer is to, control, is to stop making fridges and shipping them to the US because there's no money in there. China's ambition is to go for the techs. FinTech, nanotech, uh, green tech, biotech, uh, every single word with the tech on the end of it, they want to do, okay? This is the future for China. India couldn't care less about that kind of stuff. Yes, it's important, but their main play is software, software, digital programming, and money. That's one of their biggest plays. And one of the greatest markets can be therefore transferred, re-engineered with a few signatures. So watch out. We will see more uh, commanding changes. And it's all about... Um, uh, transforming the customer experience. And of course, uh, we're back in the one customer conversation because we're back in the situation where today I phone, I don't know about your bank, I phone them up to do with my corporate bank account. Uh, I've got three companies with the same bank. Uh, then uh, we, we're running a hotel and that's got its own bank and its own relationship manager. And then we've got our personal pensions advisor. And so it goes on from bad to worse. So what, the, what I want and what, my custom, what all of us want is a one-second, two-second, three-second experience. So I get through to the right person on the first call, and while I'm there, I say, by the way, can you send me a new credit card? Uh, sorry, sir, I need to put you through. Actually, typically, it's, by the way, I've got a rogue credit card transaction I need to inform someone about, or I've lost my card, or whatever it is. So joined upness, completely seamless, one bank, one customer, one relationship, one rating on one mobile app. This is where we're going. All linked to location. You see, it, because it's all mobile, the one single fact that the bank really needs to know, which it doesn't at the moment, is where I am. Because if you know where I am, actually you've got a good way to manage my risk. If you know that my device is in Singapore, then you're going to pick up, you can, you've seen me get off the plane in Singapore, then you have a very good chance of intercepting all kinds of roguish payments that are happening in London, my home city, pretending to me be in the moment. There are all kinds of things that happen to us once we know location. If you know location, you know how I'm thinking, how I'm feeling. If you were smart as a bank and had a contract with someone like a Google or an Apple, what it means is you would know that I'm lecturing at the moment. Why? Because I'm moving up and down, and I'm in a conference room inside a hotel. You know why I'm here? Because you've probably read my diary. Why is that? Because I've allowed you to do that. Because you're my trusted advisor on my journey of life. It's a permission-based system, and as a result, you're able to do the most extraordinary things. To help me, to guide me, and then we certainly are opening up a new world. Then we really can start to use AI, robotic advisors, uh, automated chat, all kinds of other things. But without that, you're completely blind as banks because you're always just looking at historic payment data. It simply tells you where I was shopping yesterday. It has no idea where I am right now. If we're going to be chatting, if we're going to be actually up to the moment, we have to know location. So location is, 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 is the goal. Now, predictive analytics is really, really important. All of these technologies are important. And they're really difficult to do very well and it's going to require scale. I think I mentioned this five years ago, but it's, it's got even more so. In my country, there are only seven people who buy milk for 70% of the milk. I'll say that again. 70% of the milk sales in my country are bought by only one person. 
70% of the bread is bought by only one person. 70% of painkillers are bought by only one person. 70% of the online marketing campaigns are bought by only, well, seven people actually, it's seven people buying these things. Seven companies, seven people buying 70% of the bread, seven people buying 70% of the milk, seven people buying 70% of the digital campaigns. Meanwhile, when we look at banking for financial services, so our world is too small for more than two airline manufacturers. We can't do it. The economies of scale and risks are too complicated. We've just killed off one mobile phone operating system. We can't cope with three, so Windows has been killed. We just have Android and iPhone. Um, we only have 10 large pharma, five large auto companies, but we have, I think, no one knows how to count it, but it looks like about 25,000 um, credit unions and banks. Is this sustainable? When compliance and regulatory costs and risk management, as we're hearing, is becoming more and more complicated, it's a complete nonsense. So we can expect, therefore, the process of mergers to continue. And you know it's, uh, it, it has been going on <laughs> for a long time, and we will continue to do so. At the same time, as we see pressure from non-banking competitors. So in a week and a half, uh, a friend of mine who was on the phone to yesterday, he is a digital entrepreneur. He deals with smart data. He can tell more or less everything about who you are uh, without knowing your name or address. But actually, he does know your name and address, probably. He's got algorithms based in the US which allow, us to allow him to more or less completely accurately know who you are, where you are, what you've been doing on your mobile phone, what's happening on all your other mobile devices, even when you're completely anonymized, if you're using VPNs or whatever it is, he still knows that. How is that? Because of the gigantic amount of data which you're leaking from your mobile devices all the time. Now, this individual um, is, is having a meeting with uh, the Federal Reserve. Why? Because the United States banking system realizes they need this kind of data profile to be able to actually root out a lot of fraud. Big, big issues taking place, big, big conversations with regulators who are struggling to catch up with a world that may not need banks in the future in quite the way we have done in the past to move money around, as we've seen in Africa. In fact, as you probably know, in Kenya, 40% of the global economy is remittances just chundering back and forth using telcos. 40%. It's not going through banks at all. Meanwhile, uh, we've got, as I say, it's not just compliance costs, cyber risk, customer innovation, global support, capital adequacy. No wonder it's very difficult for boards at the moment. No wonder that we're going to see more banks who are completely abandoning their existing retail platforms and say, oh, we can't do it. There's no one who understands our code. We just have to migrate. We're going to have to start again. Every time we have a merger, we're paralyzed for another five years. 92 of the world's largest banks are still using IBA mainframe technology. 92. 92%. 100 million of them, they're spending about 100 million on maintenance per bank, maintaining old text, old code in COBOL that nobody really understands. One of the difficulties in migrating, of course, is that no one's sure <laughs> What horrors you'll discover. <laughs> you think you've got 20 interdependencies, you migrate across, and suddenly Forex doesn't work because of some extra link you forgot about. So, meanwhile, fintech investment going through the roof. Very interesting. Fintech partners, of course, are really struggling. How on earth do they get access into side COBOL systems? It's just really, really difficult. How do they even begin to have a digital conversation inside these monsters? When, th when the banks don't even understand their own systems or code. So no wonder there's such conversation about open banking. Open banking is probably one of the biggest steps towards agile innovation for the next 10 years. Um, opening up little windows, APIs, that allow us to get golden nuggets of data flowing freely in a very secure way uh, across from uh, the central bank core systems into an independent entity that's providing fintech modules. The reason why it's so important is because it means that an individual like me who's got bank accounts with many banks all over the world, it means on one app, I can see an integrated view. But for the bank, not necessarily <laughs> so comfortable. And then there's the cloud. The trouble with the cloud is that banks are confused about it. So you've got 
46% of banks, large banks, spending 11 to 20% of their IT at the moment on cloud, and projecting 63%. But in every board, huge dilemmas, as you know, because of this. Um, and uh, it was this area which I want to end on. You know what? Um, uh, it, it was big five years ago, but it's nothing compared to what it is today because of what we've built. When you put the Internet of Things together with big data and uh, cloud and AI and robotics, you create the mother of all targets for every criminal in the world. And e-commerce is out of control now in many nations. You know, we've seen $19 billion of e-fraud in the US alone last year. Um, and, uh, you know, it's affecting every part of society. You know, 8% of online merchant uh, uh, transactions at the moment in America are fraud. They're just completely criminal. Um, if you go back, uh, sorry, um, uh, up to 43% of US e-commerce orders are fake in peak months. Think about that. 43% on Black Friday, this Black Friday, will be fake. Please don't tell me the web's healthy. The web is bust. Any other payment system where you say 43% of all the transactions on the, on the cash machine, on the ATMs, are fraudulent. You would be very worried. There would be a national crisis. But because it's online, it's all hidden. 7% of the entire US population had their identity stolen last year. So did I. Put your hands up if you've had your own ID stolen. There's no shame in this. Put your hands up if you've had your own ID stolen. Have a look around, folks. We are the most sophisticated people. It's about 5% or 10% of the people in this room. I've got two-step verification, 25 keys. I, 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 I won't bore you with all the systems I put in place. I was, do you know what? I was made out to be a criminal. I phoned the bank. I said, my identity's been stolen. No, 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 sir. We're calling the police. Said, what? You are the... We've been warned that you would call us. I said, what? It takes me 25 minutes and, you know, threatening to elevate the call to get my account back, okay? 20 minutes later, my wife says, it's gone blocked again. I phoned the back. I said, we're definitely calling the police. 20 seconds after... 20 seconds, the real Dr. Dixon phoned us and told us that, as he predicted, his identity had been hijacked again. Now, we know you're a criminal and you live in Prague. Well, no, 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 no. I'm on a business trip in Prague. I live in London. <laughs> and these criminals were only just around the corner. They were so clever. Physical criminals right there in London. Very clever things. Do you know how they did it? <laughs> Very clever. We'd done two orders with the same company. I think it was for gas central heating. Two orders with the same company gave them two entry points. So the first thing when they do is they try to ID you, and then it fails, and it fails, and it fails. They say, well, can you name me two transactions that happened recently? Yes, I can. I've got them in front of me. So that was the way they got in originally. Terrible. But I'm just saying, we've got 66% growth of account takeover in a single year in the US. And as for, as for ATM machines, I, have a, I, I could buy a technology today for 700 euros which would allow me to skim read every single credit card here in the next 15 minutes. Does that matter? I think it does. It means this stuff is really, really broken. We're going to have to think again. And of course, when it comes to keeping data, oh my goodness, we see these kinds of accounts, you know, three billion loss of usernames and passwords. I guarantee almost every one of you, put your hands up if you've checked recently whether one of your passwords is already being sold. Put up your hand online. You've actually typed in your own name to see if your passwords are there. Well, I suggest the rest of you might need to do so, because you might find that 50% of the people here, your passwords are already known, some of your passwords, and they're already being sold online. Big, big stuff. And the banks are as bad as... It's very difficult to keep people out. And so many weak passwords. You know, uh, one in a hundred people in the whole of Portugal use one, two, three, four, five, six. Another 1% use 123456, 7, you got it, and you know where this is going, don't you? <laughs> one, another 1% 1 use 123456, that means I know 1 in 33 passwords just by using the numbers on the first line. <laughs> we shouldn't be laughing, should we? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a disaster for us. No wonder the banks are getting blamed. I mean, it's, we need to sort this out. We shouldn't be allowing these kind of passwords in. Did you know that in your own IT department, 25% of your workers are regularly trying to access data they're forbidden to see. Did you know that? <laughs> they just do it for fun. Just for fun. And did you know that 66% of them manage it? <laughs> so we're being broken from the inside. We, because so many passwords have been stolen, we can analyze them. I know that if you live in London and you were born between 1980 and 1990, there's a 30% probability that the word L-O-V-E will be somewhere in your password. 
30%. Extraordinary. And people are using the same passwords on many sites. They're, even when people know that their password has been stolen, most people only change that password on one site, even though they're using the same password in the bank, on the pension fund, uh, on their other bank accounts, for Twitter, Facebook, and everything else as well. So it, we are in a really big situation here, and the bad news, unfortunately, is that no one's getting caught. Most fraud is not even reported. 99.6% will never get prosecution. There's very few uh, cross-border. Um, it's, it's one of the quickest ways to make money, actually, uh, for, for young people today. It's a marvelous career path. So it needs to be sorted, and we can't do it on our own. It will require artificial intelligence tools. It will require the same quality and better of sheer genius and creativity that we're seeing, um, the kind of thing that's being used now to predict which uh, uh, oil rig blows up. We need to be predicting where the next hack attacks are likely to come from. And by the way, people say Bitcoin will sort all this out. It won't, and with this I finish. If only it would. I don't know if you've looked recently. I wrote a book called Sustained Agility about green tech. And I'll tell you, there's a Bitcoin problem. Did you know that even, we're not really using Bitcoin at all, but you can only do seven transactions per second on Bitcoin. Visa uses 24,000. Uh, and by the way, each transaction usually takes about 20 minutes. I mean, come on. Uh, this is like going backwards to the dark ages. We have to find an alternative technology to this. This is incredibly costly. We've, we're just playing around with Bitcoin. We're hardly using it at all. But already, the carbon footprint of Bitcoin is equivalent to the entire carbon footprint of Denmark. Does that matter? I think it does. Blockchain also will be very useful for us in the future, I'm sure. And there's innovation going on inside this room on this technology. But let's be a little bit, I'll just say, let's have a reality check. <laughs> God, because here is the reality. 1.7 billion has been spent so far by the largest banks in the world, and there's not a single, and, and those banks do not have a single functioning blockchain application to show for it. So what does it mean? It means that in summary, in summary, just to take us back, okay. Small things create huge magic. Small things can lead to tremendous risk reduction. Small things can have a massive impact on customer experience. Small things can speed up transactions in extraordinary ways. But to find those moments of genius is a lot of work. And it's very, very difficult to be as agile, as sophisticated, and as high-powered as we have to be for the future. I don't believe it's possible any longer for individual banks to have their own e-banking strategy or their own cyber banking strategy, their own regulatory and compliance, regulatory environment strategy. We have to do it together. And the only way to deliver what customers need to comply with regulation and reduce risk is with agile technology, rapid innovation, strong partnership, and global collaboration, which is precisely why we're here again for the seventh consecutive year. Why are we here? We're here as co-opetition co working together, collaborating with the best brains in the world to tackle some of the most complex and urgent issues that banking has ever faced. So I wish you every success as you continue to navigate these things for the rest of the program. Thank you. <laughs>